Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're going to have fun with a hero episode, and we're going to be sitting now with Mr. Tim Shope, who is the Director of Digital Transformation at Avid Solutions. And you guys may remember Tim from our episode where he was talking about the evolution of manufacturing post-COVID. He brought a lot of value to the listeners then, so really looking forward to learning more just about Tim in general. So Tim, welcome. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for the uh, opportunity. Glad to be back. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love to have you back. You know, and uh, we always kind of like to kick these off just to let uh, listeners know a little bit about how you got to the role you're at now, because you're the director of digital transformation now. So what led you to that? <laughs> it has been a uh, it's been a long journey and, and I got to be completely transparent, not one that I planned. It, uh, sometimes things just happen to you and they happen to you for the right directions, the right reasons. It, it all really started probably when I was in high school back in the uh, long time ago. I'm not necessarily going to tell you how long ago. Car stereos became the thing, and I got really involved. I actually took a part-time job working at a uh, car stereo place, installing car stereos, and I got really excited around electronics and the things that you could make it do, and then I got even more uh educated, I guess, around spectrum analysis and frequency analysis and frequency response and building subwoofer boxes and porting those and what frequencies would come out of the pipe and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that was at uh, 15, 16 years old. And so I wanted to learn more about electronics and and electricity and and the the things that were powering that. And so I I joined the, the U.S. Navy and they had uh, an advanced electronics program, which was a six-year program. Basically, the first two years, you went into uh, uh, electrical and electronics training, and it was great. I learned basically in two years, 24 hours a day school, the, the equivalent of what would be a, a double E, just an electrical side, because we didn't take any uh, electives, right? You, <laughs> in the military, you don't have electives. You, you do what they tell you to all the time. But it was it was uh, it was great. It was a great experience. I met some uh, some dear friends that have been friends for life. That that educational experience got me my first job working uh, for a uh, supplier that did quality control measurement analysis of paper as it was being manufactured. Right, we could measure the the weight, the thickness, the color, the fiber orientation angles, the moisture, the you name it, properties of paper as it was being manufactured. And then we could control that. And this company was founded in the 80s. And uh, we did a lot of statistical process control analysis. We did advanced process control in a spatial environment, in a time series domain environment, back when we had 64K of memory, right? So you had to be very eloquent in the way that you controlled things with that little bit of programming space and the company was based in California in uh, Cupertino actually the uh, the campus is now part of Apple's campus and so they had the best and the brightest at their fingertips right and a lot of the people that I got to know and got surrounded with and got to experience their line of thinking their ways of development you know they they were masters from MIT they were uh, physicist. It, it was just amazing. And it was just a, a fruitful environment in a company that was founded on delivering results and, and delivering value. And the more time I spent in that company, the more I moved from a, a electrical electronics technology repair maintenance uh, service standpoint to more of an optimization, a uh, control design and, and deployment standpoint so in that environment i got to grow from a uh, from a tech 
technical environment into more of an optimization and, and software control environment. And it, it, was, it was just a, a wonderful opportunity to land in a company like that. I'm reminded, Tim, just, just to interrupt you for a second of Proximity Principle. I don't know if you've heard of that book by Ken Coleman, but it's all about you want to, to, to get good at a space or you want to enter a certain area, you surround yourself in proximity with those influencers. And it sounds like that was an amazing opportunity for you to be in proximity, to, to be able to have that influence on your careers. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah, I wouldn't know. Uh... Wouldn't trade working for that company for anything in the world. And also, thank you for your service, sir. It's my privilege. We definitely have a lot of respect for gentlemen like you, you know, for any of the, the branches that are on forces. Uh, so we have several working at ECO. I think you met one a while back through an engagement. And uh, so just definitely anytime we hear that, we want to, to acknowledge that. And, you know, there are a lot of listeners out there for eco asks why that we're trying to inspire to to grow their careers and to you know for one to get into this uh, manufacturing and industrial environment so you've you've obviously had a lot of success a lot of touch points what would be some advice that you would offer up out front to that listener out there who's considering this as a career uh, in the future i think it's uh let it become your passion <laughs> I'm getting older every day, aging at a dog's pace, as they like to say at this point. But I've never, I've never worked. I've never had a job. I've had a career. I've had a passion. That's awesome. I mean, if you are passionate, if you find that passion, you, like I said, you never have a day where you go to work. And uh, it can be found. And uh, you're an inspiration for, for a lot of that right there. So, you know, you're in a, in a very complex moving role your, your world is changing a lot. You know, obviously with COVID, it's changed even more uh, rapidly recently. So what do you see? I know it's kind of hard to look down the road, but so far, but maybe the next 12 to 24 months as the greatest challenges that, that you're going to be facing or the industry is going to be facing that, that you can see. Uh, I think in a lot, of, a lot of ways, the things that we're going through today is uh, almost, you know, you could almost – hate to really compare it to, to like World War II, but it's almost uh, wartime manufacturing, right? It's how do we take facilities, whether they continue to manufacture the goods and services that they always have because they are in critical supply and demand today. <laughs> toilet paper, right? I mean, go to, go to any local grocery store and try to find a roll of toilet paper. I've got a number of, number of friends that are still in the paper industry and uh, they are, uh, they're wide open trying to meet that demand. And that's, you know, critical demands like uh, uh, material for N95 masks for the uh, medical and frontline personnel in this country today that are putting it on the line. No doubt. No doubt. And Tim, with your diverse background, you, you've had a lot of different areas that you've had to learn. So what are some of those resources that you utilize to enhance your education and what are you studying right now? What are some of those areas that you're that you're focused on learning right now that maybe our listeners would want to start spending some time you know, investing in themselves in those areas? I think the biggest thing today is the, the availability of online education, right? You know, when I was in the military and in the middle of the, uh, the Mediterranean for six months at shot, it was, uh, it was a little difficult to, uh, to, to go to a college class. And, and that, is, that is available at your fingertips today. I, I will say that my six months stay in the Mediterranean prepared me very well for COVID-19, right? If you can ride a boat for six months, you can probably hunker down in your house for a few weeks. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's it's the, uh, the educational opportunities that are at your fingertips. You know, a number of suppliers and vendors, the, the ability right now with uh, forums and industry trade shows that have gone virtual, uh, as opposed to attendance required today, you know, where you used to would had T and E considerations from a cost perspective. A lot of them had a uh, registration fee because you know they were feeding new lunch and everything every day. Those, a lot of those events have gone virtual today, and you can sign up and uh, you can attend them virtually. You get the opportunity to network virtually with people. You get to meet people that can expand your perspective and your career and help help expose you to new avenues. 
you know, I've done a number of online trainings during the, uh, the uh, stay at home order. And what I've actually started doing is I'm signing up for a lot of their, uh, their Asia Pacific trainings. And so I can do them at night. I can do my day job. I can have whatever virtual meetings, whatever my, my normal routine requires. And then from eight o'clock at night to 11 o'clock at night, I can attend a, a session on analytics or how to work better remotely or, or explore different technologies that are out there in the commercial sector today that have not made it into a manufacturing environment today. That's, uh, you know, it's 24 hours a day. You don't have to attend middle of the day stuff. Uh, you just sign up for the Asia Pacific. You know, I saw, I was looking, you know, at your, some information about you prior to, and, and I see you're a Gary V follower. And when you were answering that, uh, that, that answer right there, one word came to mind is hustle. And if you want to, if you want to make it and, you know, it, it's available, but you got to put in the work. And I think you you just explained to some listeners out there, some ways you want to go hang on the rim. Nobody's going to get you to the rim except yourself. You know, you, you, you got to put in that work. So that's outstanding, man. I, and I, I would like to ask you from a from a mentor standpoint, who would be some influencers out there for you that, that have helped you along in your career? Helped me along in my career. There's one guy at the, the company I mentioned earlier, Measure X, that, that got bought by Honeywell. He was our uh, service organization leader. And uh, to your point, one of his key phrases that he taught me very early in my career was, you earn your paycheck at, during the day and your promotions at night. Nice. And that is nice. That's it right there, right? Yep. Well, how about this? Uh, this got brought up with a, another guest that we had on Eco Ask Why. And he's a young reliability engineer. He's, he's investing in training in himself. And the one thing that he brought up was like, I want to get to my point in my career where I can pay it forward, right? And you have got just a, a lot of experience, a, a lot of life lessons that I'm sure you, that you can teach others. How are you paying it forward to that next generation that are, that's coming up, you know, on the heels uh, of us every day? I think it's a, it's a two way street right now. You know, certainly I try to convey the work ethic, the learnings of the past, right? I don't think we can ignore the things that we have learned in, in the in the past, just to adopt new technologies today, I think that that my role, honestly, is a bridge between the two of those. It, it's taking the learnings of the past and combining them with the technologies of today to create future-proof operations. So I try to instill in the, the next generation the things that, that I learned, whether it's from process control or optimization, back when we used to you know, sit down at a console and write down process variables as we made step responses and graph them out and calculate PID terms by hand. Whereas today, there's a number of technologies. You just say, go tune FIC 201 and it's step tested, bump tested. You have a slider that you can, you know, change between aggressiveness and and, and stability and, and it, it completely models the process for you. That kind of compute horsepower did not exist, you know, when I started in this industry. When I started in this industry, I didn't have a laptop. We we had an 8086 computer with WYSIWYG and one, two, three, you know, and a black and white monitor to graph all this stuff out. So I guess I did just kind of tell you how old I am. <laughs> um, okay. but, but in today's environment, you can do more on the phone in your hand and the younger generation, I'm trying to learn from them because they do some things with such ease and grace from a technology standpoint. And I'm just saying, okay, show me how you did that so I can show you how to apply that to what we had to do and how we do it today. And I think that is the, the biggest thing. You know, the way the younger generation learns today, particularly from a technology standpoint, is not necessarily sit down with a row of manuals and read them, they play with it. They intuitively know what they think it should do. And then as they hit bumpers of what it doesn't do, they learn how to optimize it from the, that direction. 
And that's wonderful. It's great. It's very quick learning curve, et cetera, except for when you get into some hazardous conditions or processes that are volatile, you don't have the opportunity to just go play with that process, right? So we've got to find ways to either create digital twins that allow them to play and figure things out, right? Find those constraints in a harmless virtual environment or things like we're doing with uh, North Carolina State as, as a SMITE for uh, the SESME Institute. We are deploying the IoT environment in a learning environment where industry is welcome to come play, test, fail fast, or technically triage ideas and opportunities in a production environment that's not a total production environment. So I, I think those are, I don't think it's, I don't think it's just me teaching them. I think they're teaching me as much as I teach them. Right, right. Now, are there any groups or, you know, if, if you're a, that young engineer right now that, that you find a lot of value in? I mean, it could be LinkedIn. It could be other platforms. Anything you'd recommend there to help accelerate their careers? Certainly LinkedIn today. And definitely in the, uh, in the, the COVID-19 environment we're in today, you're seeing more and more thought leaders that are just taking it personally to, to get their messages out or their thoughts out there. And, you know, whether it's just walking down the street, video in yourself and, and posting a, a quick three minute video blog of a relevant idea, it's out there today. And there's LinkedIn learning that you can sign up for, you know, from a career perspective. And the others that I would still recommend is people join the industry associations, whether it's TAPI for paper or AICHE for, for chemical engineers, IEEE, ISA, right? Those are where you can still get very, very grounded in the, the processes, the methodologies, the, the, uh, the knowledge of the industry. And then you can apply your, uh, your new technologies to those, those firm groundings. I got you. I mean, I used to be a part of Tappy and would, would go to some of those meetings. And I just, it was helpful just to gain that insight and just for one, the network, you know, just because the understanding who, who can give you the assistance needed on certain projects. And, you know, IEEE, ESA is another one that we used to, you know, do a lot of work in, in engagement with that. Like you said, just having a, a access to those thought leaders, uh, I think is important and, and not downplaying uh, if there's a meeting coming up, you know, find some time to go to it or or try to at least join via phone with a webinar because there are a lot of times there's these little nuggets you can pick up in those those engagements that really help your career. And one career question I do have for you in particular is, is when do you get that fulfillment? Where, where are you at the that moment of joy? When a, uh, when a customer slaps you on the back and says, thanks. There you go. That's pretty easy. That's an easy one, right? Yep. When you when you've created value and you've made their operations better or their work life balance better or just anything that you have created value for and they tell you thank you. Now, how about a highlight for our listeners? There's something that you can look back and say that you hung your hat on that one and that that was a pretty cool project. Any anything jump out there? <laughs> a highlight project. Wow, there's there's been a lot of them. One of the coolest things I had the opportunity to do in, uh, in my career to date, well, I've done it a couple of times now, but in a, uh, a large OEM vendor, I had the opportunity to take a team of 18 process consultants with over 450 years of process control experience and have significant input into the, uh, the roadmap of a platform and prepare that platform for the future. That uh, is probably the coolest thing I've done. Sounds awesome, man. I mean, that's definitely something you can look back and have a lot of, a lot of good moments. I'm sure that that, pro that project was not uh, easy, and the the ones that give you the most fulfillment never are. So, how about we uh, we take a turn away from work for for a few minutes here, and get a li our listeners a little bit of a an idea of of Tim outside of of Avid and your current role. So what's some hobbies? What do you like to, to do in your free time, man? I play golf. Not as, uh, not as well as I once did, but uh, I'm uh, still pretty uh, an active and avid golfer. In the past year and a half, I uh, transformed a little bit and I'm now a, uh, <laughs> a fairly avid runner. I run 
about 75 miles a month now. And uh, every day that I don't don't run feels like a, a, a day that I wasted. I don't know exactly how that transformation came to be. I, I never enjoyed distance running. I was a sprinter in, in high school. And, and so if I ran more than 400 yards, it, it felt like a uh, an eternity. You know, today I, I run three or four miles a day and, and uh, it, it's now my my time to uh, to think and reflect and, and uh, get my thoughts together. And so my my wife would tell you I'm probably uh, a little obsessive about it, but, uh, you know, it's, well, it's just something I evolved into. Well, that's OK. I mean, most engineers have a little OCD, too. So, that you know, it's just the way we work. You know, I, I'm that way, too. So do you is, do you find it more of a stress relief type opportunity when when you're running? Absolutely. I mean, you put in a, uh, a set of headphones and you uh, you turn on some '80s music, and you know you're you're young again, and it gives you the the chance to think all over again. I hear you, man. Well, we also we love to hear on this podcast about our heroes and their families. Anything you like to share about your family and and what's going on there? Could not be more proud of my family. My wife is actually vice president of operations for um, Avid Solutions. She uh, is a degreed pulp and paper engineer and has an MBA and she is, um, she is amazing. And, and the, uh, she has been part of the transformation in women in engineering for a number of years. And so it's that, that's just amazing to watch her career grow in the ways that it has. And then I've got two daughters that, uh, even though they're sisters, they're completely different complete polar opposites. One's me, one's my wife watching them grow and, and explore the things that, that uh, excite them. One's a uh, competitive cheer fanatic and the other rides uh, uh, horses competitively. And so those are both uh, very time consuming activities. So it's a challenge to get them both where they need to go and, and when they need to be there. And then uh, my older son is actually uh, in an EIT program to become an industrial technician. He's following uh, kind of in our footsteps. He's uh, he played a little college golf for a while. He's an assistant pro at a local country club. So uh, when I say I don't play like I used to, it's because he uh, at, at 15 figured out how to beat me, and he's never took his foot off my throat. So. <laughs> well, that's okay. I'm sure there's a, there's things you can uh, can can whoop him at too, though. So it, yeah, it there, goes there, around. There, there's still a lot of pride. <laughs> when they beat you and then you can't beat them back, you, you know, they grew into something. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you got an amazing family you're, with your, your wife in the role she's in and your, your two daughters. And I get the polar opposite thing. I have two daughters myself. It's funny how they can grow up in the same house, right? But they can be complete. They have their own personalities. That's, re that's just really cool. And it sounds like you got a really good dynamic there, man. What's amazing is you can see those personalities the minute they get here, right? You can watch them evolve, but those two little girls, from the minute they were here, they were complete different. Right. The, the things they needed to be happy in life were very different when they were both three months old. Now, are you, uh, are you still the hero for them, or uh, have they kind of pushed dad off a little bit to the side? Yeah, I'm still, uh, well, certainly my, my younger daughter, she's definitely the, uh, as my wife refers to her, the chosen one, but she's, uh, she's, she's still, uh, she's still daddy's little girl, uh, that the older one's getting a little more to the, uh, the independent state of life, but, uh, there's still the, uh, crawl up in your lap and give you a big hug moments. That's the difference of having daughters and sons. No doubt. No doubt. I just hats off to you, man. Sounds like you got a, like I said, a great Great home life and, uh, you know, you're doing some wonderful things. You know, if you had uh, always this is just a kind of a fun question. If, if you had some some extra money in a bucket and you could spend it on anything and we're, we're not going to even worry about work. We're just going to say this is unbudgeted money for for the show family. Where would you put that at right now? <laughs> right now, we'd save it till we could go somewhere. Uh, <laughs> right till you could actually spend it on some fun right exactly as i as i said the, the company i worked for back in the 90s and early 2000s was headquartered in cupertino california 
and I got the opportunity back then, you know, we used to bring customers out and go to a factory acceptance test and right down the street was Pebble Beach. And if I had a pocket full of discretionary money right now, I would love to take my family back to Pebble Beach. And if I got to play 18 with my son on Pebble Beach and wife and daughters got to go to the spa and do all those wonderful things, that would probably be my first. You know, I might get vetoed, but that would be, I've always said, if I had discretionary funds to just go do something, I'd go back to Pebble Beach. I actually told them that, you know, when, when my time comes, y'all you know, go take a vacation and spread me out on that, uh, on that bunker on the 18th. There you go. There you go. Now I haven't asked this one yet, but I would be curious just from, from to learn from me personally too. If, if you had a, uh, describe the perfect date night with your wife, man, where are you guys going? What, what are you doing there? <laughs> That's probably evolved a good bit <laughs> in life. She would, uh, she would dearly love it if I took her to, uh, to go see a play or a show. My first response would be, we're going to, uh, we're going to Ruth Chris and we're getting a great steak and a nice bottle of wine. And, and then if we make it to the, uh, to the, to the play or the show, that'd be great. But she would, uh, she would love it if I took her to more, uh, more Broadway plays. I'm with you there. My wife, she likes, you know, you know, any of the, those Broadway plays, opera, you know, things like that, that, uh, I can't say I, I get up in the morning saying, Oh, I get to go to the opera today, but you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. we do those yeah. things, you know? Exactly. But I, you know, if, if, if money wasn't an object, you know, jump on a plane, go to New York, hit a, get a great steak and, and hit a Broadway play for the evening, probably be a, the you ultimate. You get a chance, take her to see Hamilton. That was a pretty good one. That was, I didn't fall, I didn't fall asleep at that one. So, uh, <laughs> so that, that one kept me awake, and the uh, sound of music kept me awake too. So there, there are some good ones out there. But uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> you're like, yeah. But I, I appreciate you giving us some insight here today, Tim. And I always like to uh, kind of summarize the Eco Why and the Hero Sessions in particular to talk about purpose and the why. You know, what what is what is the driving factor behind you know what you do? So ha- if you were to had to summarize that, what would that be? I think it's, uh, it's, it's learn every day, continue to innovate, uh, and, uh, you know, help this country continue to manufacture in the future. It's in some ways, it's still almost a patriotic calling because if we don't continue to manufacture and we outsource everything, you know, our supply chains become endangered. And with the standard of living that we have in this country and the way this country was founded, if we don't find efficiencies in the way that we manufacture, if we don't deploy technology and we don't continue to be a leader in how technology is developed and deployed in manufacturing and and that thought leadership, then, uh, you know, we're going to become the the best third world country in the world we're gonna have great interstate systems and uh we're gonna have a very very low gdp right if we we don't find ways to continue to uh to manufacture and produce uh we've got a problem and that's that's what inspires me every day that's right and well people like you my friend i mean you're you're inspiring others you're leading us and uh you know in many different areas and and tim you brought so much value thank you so much for your time i really enjoyed this conversation Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O. A-S-K-S-W-H-Y dot com.